All right, so we're going to get started here with right, Master's so Bible Study. Get started here with Master's Bible Study. And so, we, like I said, we're, this is something that's been on my heart for some time. This is something that's been on my heart for some time. And um, we, we used to have a midweek Bible study we that, that we did, and, Bible study and it just sort of fizzled out over time. And so, um, this, you know, I figured right now, with everything being on a summer break, this was probably the best time to start it back up again. So, we're glad to do it, and we'll just kind of um, keep an eye and see who wants to engage and wants to be involved in this. Um, and it's not really about building a big crowd, a big people, you know, a big bunch of people involved. Um, it's really just about making sure we have something that that is a blessing to the church. And so as long as the church is um, interested in it and wants to be involved in it, then we'll keep doing it. And, uh, you know, this is the first time. So, you know, it's, it's just us, but this is the first time. And I expect there'll be some more that will log in as we go along. Um, of course, we're going to do this on Zoom. And then we're also recording this. And then I'll pop it up on YouTube. And so if you guys who, you, the Serta family tonight, are just in awe of my sheer brilliance, and want to go back and watch it again, it'll be available on YouTube to do that. Um, or for folks that can't log in on the Tuesday night, you know, at this time, then they can watch it on YouTube as well. Um, we will keep these to exactly one hour. And I've set up Zoom so that it will kick us off in an hour. So we can't take any more time than that. And every night, when, or every week when we come together, we'll start with a plan for what we're going to study and we'll get as far as we get and um if we don't get everything done in the hour then next time we'll just pick up where we were and the reason i'm doing that is not because i want to shortchange the word of god and say okay let's just you know get in here and get it done but i want to be respectful of everyone's time and so you guys worked a long day and then you come here and even folks that are watching it on YouTube, I don't want this to become a two, three hour marathon every week. Um, so I wanna be respectful of time. So we'll keep it at one hour and hopefully, ideally around 45 minutes or so of teaching and then some time to take prayer requests and have some prayer together um, so that our total time is about an hour. Um, I want this to be a dialogue rather than a monologue. And, um, you know, I, I suffer from the occupational hazard of preachers, and that is that if you give me just a smidgen of a chance, I will talk continuously for one hour. But I don't want it to be that. I do want it to be a dialogue. So if you have questions, stop me and don't apologize for them. I, I want this to be an opportunity where we can really dig into the Word of God together and this be an opportunity where if you have questions, we can't do that in the morning service. That's not really the, the time or the format for that, to, to raise your hand and say, okay, pastor, can you stop and go back and let's look at that? But this is the format for it. So I want this to be a dialogue. For those joining on YouTube, of course, you can't jump in live with the questions. So if you're watching this on YouTube, if you have questions, email them to me pastor at avianobaptist.church or send them to me via, via Facebook Messenger or via WhatsApp. And I'll either answer your question there on, on Facebook or I'll just address it during the next, uh, the next study time. So what I thought we would do is this week and probably the next two weeks, I want us to start with taking a look at what this is. Uh, when when we hold this book in our hands, what what do we have, and what are we looking at? Um, what are some of the terms that we use to describe it? What does that mean? What does the Bible say about itself? And because you know the question is, is this just an ordinary book, or is it different? Is it unique and different than any other book that's ever been written? And how can we know that? And and what does the Bible tell us? And about itself and what do those things mean? So I want to I want to look at that this week, um, and we'll, again we'll get as far as we get with that. And then the next couple of weeks, I want us to look at 
having having talked about what we have in the Bible, then I want us to look in the next week or two about how do we go about studying this thing. You know, one of the phrases we use to describe the Bible is we call it the Word of God, and that's absolutely appropriate. We're going to see that here in just a minute. But if that's the case, and this is the Word of God, and we believe absolutely that it is, then we sort of owe it to the Lord and we owe it to ourselves to be able to approach this in a way that we pull out the intended meaning and we don't just start inserting our own meaning or uh, or hijacking the meaning of the word of God to make it mean whatever we want. So that's why I want to start with this. What is the Bible? And in the next couple of weeks, uh, how do we go about studying it? What are some, some good strategies for studying the word? Um, and over the next couple of weeks, I want you to be thinking about this question. Where do you want to start in our Bible study? Because what I, what I foresee us doing after these first couple of weeks is we're going to take a book of the Bible and we're just going to pick it apart. And we're going to go through it verse by verse or phrase by phrase or chunk by chunk. Um, and so I want you to be thinking about, is there a specific place you want to start? I've got some thoughts in mind, but I want to hear yours first. Where do you want to start? Um, and then we'll jump into that book and then we'll keep going from there. Okay, so how's that sound to you guys? Uh, Reuben says we should do revelations. <laughs> yeah, you know, Jean and I joked about, you know, yeah, you, Jean and I, joked about, I told her that, I said, you know, maybe we'll, <laughs> I told her that, I said, maybe we'll talk we're, about when we get here, you know, where, where do we we'll want to start? And, um, and she threw out, what about Leviticus? And she threw out, what about Leviticus? I love it. I said, yeah, Leviticus and Revelation are probably yeah, not the places to start. Not that we don't want to go there, but they may not be the places to start. <laughs> or numbers. Or numbers, Reuben says. <laughs> yeah, or First Chronicles. We can spend yeah, weeks and weeks on the begats in the first nine <laughs> chapters of Chronicles. That will be awesome. <laughs> so seriously, think about where you want to go, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into there. Um, let me open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into our study for tonight. And so, Father, we thank you that uh, as we have gathered together just a small group tonight, and Lord, we thank you for those that are joining via YouTube, and, and Lord, we just pray that as we open your word, and as your spirit that inspired this word interacts with our spirit, Lord, that we would get a sense of what you want us to learn, what you want us to know. And Father, help us as we open your word to be careful with it, to, to be diligent about how we study it, how we rightly divide the word of truth, so that we're not reading into it, we're not taking out of it what's not there, but we're just hearing what you have to say. So Father, would you teach us, would you guide us tonight, and as you do, we know you're going to, and as you do, would you help us to listen and to be responsive, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to start tonight with um, just asking the question, what is the Bible? Um, so what are some of the, the terms and the phrases and the words that we use to describe the Bible? Word, truth. The word, truth. Yeah. Yeah. What else? What else? The message, the good news. Yeah, all of those are, are yeah, all of exactly those the are, phrases are, that we use. We talk about it being the word of God. Um, we talk about it being God's message to us. Um, we talk about the Bible being holy. Uh, we, we even have, have even heard and maybe even used some more theological terms, inerrant, uh, infallible, inspired. We use a lot of words to describe the Bible, and what, where I want to start is what does the Bible have to say about itself? I mean, is when we use those phrases and we use those words, are we 
claiming more for the Bible than we ought to, than what the Bible claims for itself. So if you've got a Bible there in front of you, open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 16 and 17 tonight of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And when you have it, just somebody go ahead and read those verses 16 and 17 of 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in that text, Paul makes some very specific claims about what the Bible is. And so I want to kind of walk through those claims uh, talk about the words he uses and what those mean, and then what, what is our takeaway from that? What is it that we're, we're to understand from it? And so the first thing he says is, he says, all scripture is inspired by God. That's the translation you read, Amanda, right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. All scripture is inspired by God. Does, does anyone over there in Serta land have an NIV? Uh, we can pull it up on the app. That's what I was just Sonia's saying. gonna pull it up. Okay. Yeah, read that same verse in the NIV. Uh all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in right righteousness, so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yeah. Um, so that phrase in New American Standard or English Standard Version is inspired. In NIV, it's translated God breathed. And that really, that's one of the places where the NIV translates it better, God breathed. Now, we think of the term inspired. What, how is that used in our context, in our society? What does that mean when we talk about something, an artist is inspired or a piece of music is inspired? How do we mean that? Kind of like, uh, almost like motivating or providing um, direction um, in an artist concept, I yeah. guess. Yeah, it, it's motivating. It really touches us. We might say, man, that artist is extremely talented. That's not, might be what we mean about it. But when Paul uses that phrase or uses that word inspired, that's not what he's talking about. He's not indicating that the guys who wrote scripture were just these religiously talented writers, you know, and their word really just, you know, gets us right here in the fields. That's not what he's talking about. Um, I mean, that's one of the major criticisms of the Bible. They say, well, it's just written by men. You know, this is no different than any other book. But the Greek word that he uses there doesn't mean inspired in the sense that we think of it. Um, it's the Greek word theanousos. And that's, that, there's kind of two parts to that word. The first part is theos. And we you know, we, we know that word theology, the study of God. Theos means God. In nostos, we, it's a word that means air or wind or breath. And sometimes it's used in spirit, which says in scripture, when Jesus died, he gave up his spirit. And that's the same word. And so we put those two together. That's why it's translated in the NIV, God breathed. That's literally what Paul is saying. When he's saying the scripture is inspired, he's saying it's, it comes from the very breath of God. Now, when we think of it that way, how does that impact your understanding initially of the Word of God? Well, I mean, it helps make it more valid, you know, it definitely uh, confirms that it is truth if it is 
breathed out by God, you know, if it is his actual breath that wrote these words, then we know that there's no fallacies in it. It's, you know, it's definitely uh, something that you can trust and believe. Yeah. Yeah. Something that was spoken came from the very heart and mind of God himself. And so initially, just that initial phrase, just on the surface tells us there's something unique about this book. This is not just any old book of religious pithy sayings or um, proverbs for life. It's much, much more than that. And the, the way that word is described or defined rather is a communication that has been ordained by God's authority and produced by the enabling of his spirit. And that really says something, just that one word really tells us something incredible about the Bible. It tells us, first of all, that it is God's spoken word. And when, when we just think about that for just a moment, um, and we realize that God has chosen to communicate with us, he doesn't need to. God would be completely holy completely righteous if he never said a word to us. He let us go on into eternity, getting exactly what we deserve, and that is separation from him for, for all of eternity, and he never said a word to us. He would be completely righteous and holy. He didn't communicate with us for himself. He communicated with us for our sake, and that's an amazing thing. Someone flip over to Hebrews chapter 1. a couple of pages over. Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 3. When you find that, go ahead and read that verse, those verses. We're looking for it. Yep. Just a couple of books to the right. There we go. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. All right. Uh, long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what, what the Hebrew author is telling us is that God has been communicating with mankind all along. Started from the very beginning. The, the very first thing that we read about in Scripture that God did was he spoke. And he has been communicating with mankind. He spoke long ago through the prophets, through our our um, fathers in the faith, and we're looking at some of those on Sunday morning heroes. He spoke long ago through them, and in these last days, this these times that we're in now, he's spoken to us through his son, and he's chosen to speak to us. And without that, there is no way that we could possibly know him. This is what Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. I'll get this one. 1 Corinthians 2, 11. He said, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. And when we think about the definition of the word inspired, that this has been produced by the enabling of his spirit, we could not have possibly understood one thing about God, except that he did this, that he produced this book so that we can know some things about him. And sometimes we call the Bible God's revelation to man, and I think that's very fitting because a revelation simply means to reveal something, to make known something that was not known before. And apart from 
the spirit of God revealing the heart of God through the word of God, we would have no hope of knowing anything about him, not knowing our condition, our sinful condition, and certainly not knowing anything about him. And as Peter describes what has happened, how it is that we came to have this book that we call the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. I'm sorry, it's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. I was, I was reading it and I thought, no, that's not the least bit right in 1 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. He says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of un one's own interpretation. In other words, what we have in the Bible is not something that these early church fathers gathered around a table in some smoke-filled room and said, all right, we got to write some book to keep these people in line. We've got to put some things down to, to make them fearful of their eternity so that they will do what we want them to do. He said, it's no, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. The Old Testament prophets, the New Testament prophets, they didn't, they didn't say, you know what, I think God would want to say this and this and this. The things that they wrote down were not their own decisions. They were not an act of their human will, but men moved along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, you remember what Peter's profession was, right, before Jesus called him. What was his profession before he was called the follower of Jesus? He's a fisherman. A fisherman. Peter would have spent an awful lot of time in the water. And, and I think as he thinks about the breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit of God, you almost kind of get this idea he has in his mind, the wind catching the sail of a boat. And it carried those prophets along as, as they wrote down what God wanted them to write. And so we, we just think about this one phrase that, um, that Paul uses. It's just so packed with meaning about what the Bible is. And the clear testimony, I think, especially when we put Paul's words and Peter's words together and Paul saying this, this is inspired by God. Peter talking about those guys were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We put those two things together and we say, man, this, this act of God in giving on this, us this was just something absolutely incredible. And the clear testimony of the biblical writers is that they seem, they seem to know that when they put pen to paper or when they grabbed a quill and were, and were scribbling on parchment, they seemed to understand that what they were producing was not their own work. Moses said, thus says the Lord. That's the phrase you know, we hear often over and over again in the Old Testament. Moses said that hundreds of times, thus says the Lord. Isaiah says it 20 times. Over a hundred times in Jeremiah, he says that, thus says the Lord. Ezekiel, 60 times he says it. Daniel responds to the sound of God's word. You know, we get this clear sense when we read these, even the Old Testament prophets. These guys knew that what was happening here in this moment, this was something unique. There was a, a connection happening with the God of the universe that was just absolutely beyond anything that you, any book any any other scroll they had ever act they'd ever read in their lives just one word this is inspired by god thought so far i thought it was really neat how um 
you were saying that, you know, obviously the scripture is, is breathed out by God, but how no one knows the mind of God, but the spirit. And so it just, it makes sense that without the Holy Spirit, there's no way we can understand the Bible. Um, I think we could read it all day long, but we could never accurately perceive it and understand it without the Holy Spirit doing its work, you know? Yeah. Also, like, it'd be one thing if uh, there's several books that there's still some debate as to who wrote it, and that kind of sh- kind of leads to your point that folks weren't trying to get personal credit. They didn't need the byline. They weren't saying written by or like, you know, this is what I think or um, which they could have and, you know, for self-righteous reasons, but it makes sense that because they were writing it, their one, their purpose was to write what they were being told to write, not what they felt they needed to write kind of thing. Right, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yes, yeah, some of the books are anonymous. The book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews never identifies himself. Um, and, you know, the, when, when we look at the book of Hebrews and we say, well, the author, you know, we don't know who it is. So therefore, how do we know that they were inspired of God? Well, if, if the Holy Spirit inspired this whole thing, then there is a continuity to the message from beginning to end and it's and it's absolutely amazing when you when you think of <clears throat> the number of authors with the number of different uh, diverse backgrounds over the the vast number of years the different upbringings of all of those people different education levels all of that when you think of all of that and these guys didn't always have access to each other's work when they were writing and yet there is a consistent theme, a consistent message throughout the scripture. And so you, well, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is. How do we know it fits in with, it should be a part of the word of God. We know it because the message is consistent. It's one of the ways we can know that. And it really is an argument from silence to say, well, we don't know who the author is, therefore it shouldn't be in scripture. Well, yeah, like, like you say, Ruben, maybe it could just very well be the author said, I don't need to identify myself. I don't need credit. So I'm not going to mention who, who I was when I wrote it. But we think, too, it, it's, it's the word of God which tells us it reflects the character of God. When we look at Scripture, realizing that this, is, this was breathed out from the very heart of God, then that tells us something important about the nature of the book that we're reading. So somebody flip back to Matthew chapter 15 in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, what verse? 18. 18? Mm-hmm. It says, but what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. Yeah, it defiles a person for sure, but but the the point the other point that Jesus is making is that what we say reveals what's in our heart. We've all had this experience. God doesn't have it, but we've all had it, where we get angry, and we say something, and then afterwards we say, "Oh, I didn't really mean that." Well. We may not have meant to say it, and when we, when we were in control of our emotions, we wouldn't have said it, but when our guard's down, when we're angry, it came out, and though we didn't mean to say it, it was in our heart, and those are, those are because of those are unguarded moments reveal what is really deep down inside, and what we say reveals a great deal about our character, how we talk how we speak, what words we use, and, and what the tone and all of those, that, spe- that says a great deal about our character. The, the fact that this is the word of God reveals his character. Whenever an author writes, it, it reflects something of them, their personality, their characteristics. And so when we apply that to the Bible, that tells us some things about it. 
if it reflects the character of God, we know that God cannot lie. Therefore, his word is always going to be true. We know that he is truth. That's how Jesus defined himself. And since he is truth, we know that this is the ultimate source of truth. We sometimes call it the Holy Bible. And holy means morally perfect, morally pure. And if it reflects God's character, God is holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Then his word necessarily will be holy. It will be perfect. It has perfect integrity. We talked about that just a moment ago from start to finish. The story, there was a constant storyline going through the word of God. And he has authority overall. If, if assuming we, we, we recognize that God is the creator of all things, therefore he has authority over all things, therefore his word is the final authority. And so we just think about even just the fact that as the word of God, it's going to reflect the character of God, which that in itself tells us something incredible about it. And we use these terms infallible and inerrant. Um, have you heard those terms? What do you think those terms mean? Did you hear me? Because I'm using buttons. No, no, I think you were still muted. I was saying the infallible would be with to me it means without flaw and without fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and inerrant is that a, is that another phrase you've heard a lot? You know, of course, in Southern Baptist churches we use those phrases, and it's, uh, not, it's not a Southern Baptist thing. It is a biblical thing, but. Not as uh, not as familiar with it, I guess, this way. Yeah. And just think about what the word says, inerrant, without error. That's what it means. And so, I mean, those, and those are terms that are very appropriate based on this passage of Scripture. Again, if the, if the word of God reflects the character of God, um, then you know, the question is not, is the Bible true? The question is not, does the Bible contain mistakes? The bigger question is, could God make them? And once we, once we come to terms with the fact that God is the self-existent one, the holy and perfect one, he could not possibly make a mistake. And then we, then we say then that the question about could the Bible, does the Bible contain mistakes is a silly question. Are there things in the Bible that are wrong or things we should disregard? It's a silly statement. This is the word of God that reflects the character and nature of God. And the question, could the Bible contain a mistake, really is the question, could God make a mistake? And since the answer to that is no, then we know the Bible doesn't have any. And we live in this age of skepticism. And everything is questioned. The concept of truth itself is questioned. You know, people say things like, speak your truth. And I know they mean that as a, a motivating thing, you know, to speak up and stand up for yourself. But just the phrasing, speak your truth, as though just because I said it, it makes it true. We, and we hear things sometimes, perception is reality. This is my reality, your reality. And so we live in this age of skepticism where truth is sort of this sliding scale and this, you know, this squishy concept. And we, but we have to have something that is grounded, something that is a plumb line that doesn't move. The Bible's not mostly perfect or nearly true or just about 98% pure. It's not that every word, of, every word of God is pure. That's what the proverb writer said. 
So we just think about just that one word. And that's, that's a whole lot. We have covered now 35 minutes on one word, inspired. And what that means is such a, such a packed term to say, man, this, when, when I'm holding this book, I am holding the very words of the God of the universe. And that's an incredible thing. Words that he had, he had no need to give to me, and yet he chose to just the same. But then he goes on. He said, he didn't just say it's inspired, it's inspired for a reason. God does everything for a reason, everything for a purpose. What's the purpose here? What's the reason why God did this? It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. He said it's profitable for teaching. John 17, 17. Jesus is in the middle of what we call the high priestly prayer. He's praying for believers shortly before his crucifixion. He's praying for believers. And he says this in verse 17, John 17, 17. He says to the Father, he's asking the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And Paul said, this is breathed out by God. That makes it sufficient for teaching believers the truth, teaching everyone the truth. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, he said in Romans 10. This is profitable. It's it's, a, it's good for this purpose, teaching believers in truth, reproving those in sin. He said, teaching reproof. What does it mean to reprove someone? Is that like uh, when we're correcting or adjusting? It could be, but he makes a distinction between reproof and correction. So there, there has got to be a difference between those two terms, between reproving and correcting. And I think the, go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, I was going to say then more, would it be along the line of encouraging? Yeah, I think the difference is, I think you're on to something. You're down the right road when you say it's it's a correction. I think the difference between the terms reproving and correction are what are we correcting? Are we bettering? Yeah, I mean, if you just think about it, you know, even the word sounds, it kind of has this connotation, reproof. It's an yeah. admonition. You know, we're, we're, it's like when we yell at your kids, you're, you know, they do something wrong and you chastise them, verbally chastise them for it. That's the idea of reproving. And so it is the idea of correcting, but it's the question of what am I correcting? And a reproof would be correcting someone in sin, using the word of God to correct someone in sin. Flip over to Matthew chapter 18. This is that passage that we call church discipline. Matthew 18, verse 15. When somebody has it, go ahead and read it. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Yeah, go and rebuke him in private. Reprove him. Correct him. And my translation, New American Standard says, show him his fault. And how do we show him his fault? How do, how do we bring, bring sin to our brother's attention? Well, the only way you can know what is wrong is to be shown what is right. So the only way we can show him there, his sin is to bring him to the word of God. And Paul said, this is sufficient for doing that. This is the place to go. We're going to reprove somebody and correct their sin. And then he says correcting. Again, there's a difference between reproving and correcting. Correcting those in error. There's a difference between being in sin and being in error. 
being in sin means I know the word of God and I'm not doing it. Being in error is either I don't know or I've misinterpreted something in scripture. And I, and I may be applying it based on my, my wrong interpretation. That's an error. But it, it's good for correcting me to bring people back to the truth and to know this is what the truth really says. And then he says, training in righteousness. And all of the, the word of God is good for all of that. And he says it's sufficient. Verse 17, that the man of God may be adequate. And that doesn't mean just barely enough, right? That's what adequate means to us. Yeah, good enough. And that's that's not really what he means. That well, you know, if we if we are taught and have our sin corrected, we're we're trained in how to apply the word of God. That's the difference between teaching and training. Teaching is what we should believe, training is how we should live based on that. And if and if we do all those things, well, we'll be good enough. That's not really what adequate means. It means mature, complete, outfitted to be able to do the work of God. So when we, when we just pick apart those two verses, just the words that are there, we, we realize what an incredible gift that God has given us in this book. So let me ask you a couple of questions and get, get some discussion going here. Um, based on all of that, what does all that mean? What's the implication of that? What is the, the impact of that in our lives? All that stuff that we just talked about, about the Bible, what it says about itself, what's the impact to us? Well, it should change our lives. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I mean, if we are reading as we should be and, and believing that everything we read is truth, then it should inspire us to, to live what we are reading. Um, that way, you know, like it talks about in James, we're not just speakers, we're doers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and one of the themes of the book of Hebrews is this kind of a drift that the church was in. And they're slowly drifting away from the Lord. And that happens, right? When we don't anchor ourselves to this, and, and we start to let the opinions of the world come in and start to, to shape what we think and, and shape what we do, we start to drift. And in a way that we don't even realize it. And before long, you know, we've drifted quite a distance away. I remember when I was about... I don't know, 11 or 12 years old. I had gone to a birthday party. A friend of mine had a birthday party at a lake there in town, and I couldn't swim. And so I had this inflatable shark, a big, gigantic, inflatable shark that I took with me, blew it up, and I was hanging on to that, and I was just kind of bobbing around in the lake. And what I didn't know was that the waves... I mean, they were just so gentle and they were just so comfortable, but they were slowly carrying me away from the shore. And I realized at one point in time how far I had drifted out. But I had no idea all of those moments. And just suddenly it came to me how far I had drifted away. And it was some scary moments from that point forward. But that can happen. I mean, you're right, Amanda, if we're not reading the word of God, we're not interacting with it, not taking it in, letting it shape and change our hearts, we get into a drift that before long we, we have drifted a good bit away from God and from his truth. And, and if we, when we recognize what we are holding in our hands, the Bible as the inspired word revealing the heart of God revealing the character of God, it means it has absolutely, absolute authority in our lives. We don't have the ability to use the Bible like an a la carte menu. I do like this. I don't like that. We don't have that ability. 
God has absolute authority. His word has absolute authority. So we can't cherry pick things out of scripture and say, this makes me feel good. That doesn't. The second thing is sort of impact of what we see in those two verses about the Bible is that the Bible judges us. We don't judge it. We don't look at the Bible and say, this should be reinterpreted because we have different understandings. We're more enlightened today and, and we're more woke. So we should reinterpret scripture based on what society says is right or based on what is politically correct. Right now, the you know, society says, for example, that homosexuality is okay. We don't then we don't then say, well, society says that, so we should go back and reinterpret all of those passages in the New Testament that talk about homosexuality because society has changed its opinion. Society bows to God's word. The word doesn't bow to society. We, we are not in authority over it. It is an authority over us. And since it reflects the character of God, he is sufficient for our lives. It is sufficient for our lives. Now, it doesn't give us an exhaustive set of instructions, you know. If, you know, you're having a struggle in your life, there's not, you're not going to find your boss's name in here somewhere if you're having trouble with your boss. Um, you know, I think just right now, we, there's a, a presidential election coming up in a few months. We're not going to find the names of either candidate in the word of God. It's not going to tell us this is who you ought to vote for. But it gives us principles that if what Paul said here is correct, that we are adequately, adequately equipped for what? Every good work. It gives us principles that we can apply to every single situation. So we don't have a specific, this is who you ought to vote for. We have biblical principles that we can apply to that decision and every other. And here's the, here's the, and then the, the, just his last thought is, and I think this is the most powerful for me. Since the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and since as believers, the Holy Spirit lives in us, we can expect that every time we open his word, he'll have something to say to us. He'll teach us, he'll guide us, he'll speak to us. He'll help us understand and apply it. There is a, a course called Master Life. And one of the things they talk about in Master Life is when, when you approach your Bible time in the morning, don't pray, God, speak to me. Because as, as believers in Christ who have the Spirit within us, the assumption is he's going to speak to us. The prayer, rather, is, Lord, as you speak, help me to hear you. Because his spirit is interacting. He wrote these words. He's living in our heart, guiding us into all truth, teaching us all things. And he's interacting with us as we open the word of God. And so we can, we can expect, should expect, every time we open up the Bible, God has something for us that we can apply to our lives. Okay, thoughts. I want to take the last 10 minutes or so and do some and have some prayer time. Thoughts, comments, questions. Uh, one, I was, one of the things I was thinking um, that just went through my head it doesn't necessarily connect to everything, but. Uh, What's interesting is because it is, you know, breathed, breathed, breathed by God, uh, and he's God in beginning and end, that uh, some of the proof is in the, uh, in the pudding, I guess, that uh, even today, uh, after thousands of years of this being written, uh, it still applies. Um, yeah. Yeah. And to, to situations, to uh, life, even with all our modernness and industrial revolutions and things like that. And, uh, you know, it, 
it just continues to be able to uh, speak to our needs, uh, our questions, our struggles. Um, and it just makes sense that it would. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's a great point, Ruben, because the, the reality is that despite all of our technological advances and all of the information age that we live in, mankind hasn't fundamentally changed. We're no different than, you know, a generation ago or two generations ago or 20 generations ago. Fundamentally, mankind's exactly the same. We have exactly the same problems that mankind has always had. I mean, we, we have a lot of different toys and a lot of different ways to go about them, but, but we have exactly the same issues. And so the word of God is always going to be applicable because God is always applicable. And the things that he's talking about in his word here, yeah, the culture was different then. The times were different. The customs were different. But the issues of the heart were exactly the same. And so it's absolutely applicable. That's one of the questions sometimes, is the Bible still relevant? It's an old ancient book, yeah. But the problems of mankind are old and ancient. And so, yes, it absolutely is still relevant to us and always will be because God will always be relevant in this world. Other thoughts or questions, and then we'll take some prayer requests, and we'll spend a few minutes in prayer. We're good on comments. Okay. All right. Well, let's um, let's take a couple of prayer requests. What are some things we can pray for, and then we'll close our close our time in a word of prayer tonight. So just a, a praise slash prayer request. Um, I did get a new job and I'm just waiting to hear on a start date. So praise God that I did get the job, um, but also a prayer request that I would use the job, um, you know, for his glory. And um, he's obviously putting me in that office for a reason. And so I just want to make sure that I am listening and obeying um, for what he, he is wanting me to do. Okay. Absolutely. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. No question in my mind you would get that job, but I'm glad to hear it nonetheless. What else? Uh, another praise that Amanda made it a, another year. Birthday's today. Right, well, happy birthday, Amanda. Again. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, prayer request for one of my friends in Oklahoma. Her name is Daniela. Her mom had a heart attack a few weeks ago and passed away this morning. Oh, my word. Yeah, so just prayer for her and her family. Absolutely. Um, and then another prayer request for uh, my sister, Sabrina. Uh, just She's pursuing Christ, and so we just want to make sure that she knows that she's loved and that God's holding her tight. Mm, amen. We lift up Sabrina for certain. Okay, and I'm going to just um, ask that we, uh, there, there are a lot of marriages that are struggling right now in the church, um, a lot of health issues that people are talking about, um, and so just to continue to lift up families and, and the struggles that they have um, in this community and, and being far away from, you know, family back home, and they hear about things like, you know, these things you were talking about, Daniela, and you hear about things like that and they can't be there for them and so that's very difficult as well so just lift up the families lift up the marriages um, in this community okay well let's um just uh pray as you feel led and then uh remember these prayer requests and then i'll close us out in just a moment so let's pray Uh, Father God, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to learn about your word, to, to get in deep and uh, use this opportunity, this method, this mode um, to gain the understanding so that you can continue uh, the dialogue, the relationships that you have with us, that we will um, be better at listening uh, and being obedient, that we'll be uh, stronger 
individuals in your kingdom so that we can spread your word so that we can teach others so that we can support each other and encourage each other uh, that, so that we are fruitful for you that we can provide uh, all the work that you need us to do so that you can continue and uh, and the glory be yours um, we are blessed beyond measure we are unworthy of your grace and forgiveness and we just continue to be in awe of this and uh, I just thank you for this and uh, pray that you continue to keep us in your will. Father, thank you. We have had the opportunity to open your word tonight, uh, to be challenged by it once again. Or as we talked about, we can expect that every time uh, we open your word, you'll speak to us. And so, Father, thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that we can bring these requests before you. And, and Lord, we just lift them all up to you. Uh, we know that you know each situation intimately. And so, Father, we pray that you would just be there at the point of every one of those needs. And Father, we uh, we, we thank you for this job Amanda has gotten. We praise you for it. We pray that you would enable her to think every moment about how can she use that for your glory. And Lord, we don't want to lift up Daniela to you as the loss of her mother and know that that is a pain that is just completely un, unknowable for many of us. And, and Lord, we just pray that you would just be there with her and just be her source of strength and comfort and peace and help her to know your presence, her and her family, and just sustain them through that. And Father, we, we, we just lift up Sabrina. We thank you that she's seeking, uh, that she is uh, looking for you and searching for you. And so, Father, we pray uh, that you would just uh, put people in her path uh, that, would, that would help her to see the truth of who you are. And Lord, as your spirit speaks to her, as you open her eyes spiritually, Father, we pray that she'd be receptive to you. And that, Father, that she would just come to know you in a real and personal way here very soon, Father. We just thank you for the movement you're, you're doing in her life. And Lord, we do pray for marriages and the families here uh, separated from their extended family in the States. And, Father, the, the difficulties in this community, uh, this the work pace at the base and how that is uh, just a burden on families and marriages. And so, Father, we lift them up to you and just pray you keep them strong. Lord, that you would enable the families to, to draw closer together, draw closer to you, and to lean into you, especially in the challenging and difficult times. Father, thank you for this time we've had. Thank you for this evening. We just pray for your blessing on the rest of it. On Amanda's birthday, as she celebrates, we thank you for her. And, and Father, we just pray that this night would just be used for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, well, thank you for joining tonight. And uh, hopefully next week and so we'll have some more folks that will join us. And I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you on Sunday. Thanks. Bye. All right. Good night. <laughs>